very happy to be joined now by uh, Dr. Zbigniew Brzezinski, uh, who is counselor and trustee here at CSIS. And I believe he's fairly well known in Poland and Russia, but I'll have to check on that. Uh, <laughs> Zbigniew has recently published, uh, I think, an important new book entitled Strategic Vision, uh, in which he discusses both the future of the West, but also the future of Russia. Um, so my question to him, and I'm sure he's going to want to cover other issues, is where does this Polish-Russian dialogue fit in this broader and longer geopolitical setting that, uh, that he has outlined? Uh, again, thank you for joining us. I've been traveling, and as a result, my office was just overwhelmed with correspondence and appointments, so I had to miss the session. In a way, I also feel a little relieved having to miss it, because I know that you have probably said all the things that I could or should say. But not having been here, I can't be accused of plagiarizing and repeating. So you'll just have to suffer through it and listen to some of the things you've already heard before. I have been watching with obvious sense of involvement and interest and hope the process of the Polish-Russian reconciliation. It's being pursued by responsible people with a deep sense of commitment and a sense of historical responsibility. I have over the years, however, also followed very closely from the margins, but occasionally with some involvement, the process of the French-German reconciliation, and more recent times I've had the opportunity to be marginally involved in some discussions pertaining to the Chinese-Japanese reconciliation. Hoped for, because it isn't really yet a fact. And I thought maybe what I could usefully do here is simply attempt some contrasts between the Franco-German experience and the ongoing Polish-Russian process. There are some interesting contrasts between the two, which I think are worth registering. So let me do so. First of all, I think what is striking about the French-German process is the fact that both countries were operating in a setting of symmetrical political status. That is of some importance. Both of them were conscious at the time that they are mid-size, post-imperial countries whose experience with imperial status was not fully satisfactory or could not be maintained on a unilateral basis. They both had an experience with intense, in some cases even ecstatic, and in one case murderous nationalism but they drew lessons from it. And as a consequence, they could deal with each other on a level of confidence and some political status symmetry. They're both equally influential, roughly speaking, in the European context. The Polish-Russian relationship is rather asymmetrical. Poland is a middle-sized European country of some historical awareness and ambitions, but at the same time, it is certainly not of the size of the political and socioeconomic, not to mention military, potential of Russia. So the asymmetry between the two is a complicating factor. It induces different postures, different perspectives. Secondly, in case of the French and the Germans, the process of reconciliation operated in a setting of what might be vaguely called historical consensus. That is to say, some shared notions of the historical context in which they find themselves. There was agreement that Hitlerism was evil, but there was no one-sided sense of intense grievance. And to put it very bluntly, part of that was due to the fact that the German occupation of France was relatively mild, in spite of the great myth 
of the French resistance, in which exaggeration historically probably is one of its characteristics. Um, the f fact is that Paris operated as a delightful city with theaters and restaurants and commingling between the natives, you might say, and the visitors, you might say, on a social basis for most of the occupation. That made it much easier, again, to deal with each other. Similarly, no real religious hostility because neither country, when seeking reconciliation, was no longer in a phase of intense religious commitment or religious uh, sense of separate identity. In the Polish-Russian case, it's more difficult. There is a sense of one-sided agreements on the part of the Poles, which is symbolized even with words with enormous emotive power for the average Pole. The word cutting doesn't require any explanation to any Pole. It produces a reaction not entirely unlike pro produced by the word Holocaust among Jews. You don't need to say anything. It just says something as of itself. Uh, there is some difference still between the Polish view of Stalinism and the predominant Russian view of uh, Stalinism. Uh, that is to say, more ambivalence, more equivocation, even though an increasingly large number of Russians sense the degree of evil and suffering that Stalinism inflicted on Russia, uh, but it is balanced by other considerations. There is a residual sense of religious differentiation. I wouldn't say hostility any longer, but still some sense of mutual uneasiness or some sense of differentiation that has religious implications. I understand that something important is being cooked up by the high ecclesiastical authorities, both of Russia and of Poland, and hopefully that will have a significant impact, perhaps reminiscent of the exchanges between the Polish bishops and the German bishops in the late 60s. But again, there is a complication here. The third contrast in my mind that is relevant is that in the case of France and Germany, there was a shared constitutional democratic order at work. That is to say, both were committed to democracy with genuine degree of sincerity and seriousness. And that created a political context, a doctrinal context, which was also favorable to the process of reconciliation. The disparities here between the Poles and the Russians are still there. Russia is experiencing a democratic process, a democratic awakening, especially among its middle class, which makes me hopeful about Russia's prospects insofar as democracy is in its future. But it is also true that some aspects of the Russian political system lack democratic characteristics or constitutional frameworks. It's a process that's changing. My own optimism makes me feel that we are in a transitional phase in that regard, a transitional phase which may not be too long, but nonetheless, it does introduce a somewhat different perspective on how a society ought to be governed and politically organized. Again, it's not a source of contention, but it is a disparate perspective, if you will, or disparate experience, which conditions somewhat the approach of both sides. In Russia, there is still a struggle for democracy, which is admirable in its courage, which is hopeful in its growing scope, which is promising in the absence of political fear, but it is still a process at work. The fourth difference between the two processes pertains to geopolitical aspirations. In the case of France and Germany, they were shared. That is to say, there was broad consensus in both societies that Germany and France have to be part of something larger, which is, of course, Europe, which is something to be created and to be aspired to. And, of course, they accepted and saw it as in their interest to be tied to the United States. <clears throat> 
the American connection was equally important to both, even though in the French case, always expressed with some nuances pertaining to French pride. In the case of the Poles and the Russians, that's again more ambiguous. Um, the Poles certainly see their geopolitical aspirations as involving Europe and close ties with the Russians. The Russians see themselves more as a potential co-equal in some respects of Europe and of Russia. Uh, co-equal perhaps may be too strong a word, or in any case may be unrealistic in terms of being an actual geopolitical objective, but it does define a somewhat different perspective on the world and, one, and how one therefore looks at each other. Another aspect, the fifth contrast, pertains to conflicting regional pressures under which the two parties operate. In the case of the French and the Germans, there were no regional pressures on them one way or the other, complicating the process of reconciliation. In the case of the Poles and the Russians, their ambiguities and potentially differentiated pressures. And the Poles are very sensitive regarding the Balts. They're very interested in Ukrainian independence. They would like to see Belarus evolve towards democracy. They were sympathetic to the Georgians in the case of the recent uh, territorial conflict between Russia and Georgia. In, in the case of the Russians, there is an understandably somewhat different view regarding the future of Belarus. There have been some tensions with the Balts, particularly the Estonians, in recent years. And we, of course, have the conflict with the Georgians. That, too, creates a somewhat different regional setting for the process. Again, not a bar or an obstacle to the process, but a complication in the background. And finally, I think there is probably some difference, although it's hard to define precisely, in the attitude of the French and the Germans on the one side, and the Poles and the Russians on the other, regarding the nature of the American-Russian relationship as such. In the case of the French and the Germans, a good American-Russian relationship was on the whole to be desired, and it was not feared. In the case of the Poles and the Russians, particularly the Poles may feel uneasy about some aspects of a constructive, positive, friendly relationship between America and Russia, Namely, that it may diminish the American interest in assuring Polish security. The Russians may view it as a process which enhances their own status if the two of them are seen as apart from the other less centrally important countries in the world. So that, too, introduces a psychological dimension that somewhat complicates the political process. In effect, um, to sum up, these contrasts, what it involves essentially is the need for the process to operate simultaneously on two levels and in an increasingly significant fact, uh, scale. The differences do make for complications. The historical experience does create tensions. There are problems to be overcome that it will take a really heroic effort to achieve success. And this is why I so admire the Russians and the Poles who are engaged in this process. But this process has to be, first of all, one that rises from the bottom up, and that is to say that involves genuine reconciliation and democratization between the peoples. The two go hand in hand, and they are mutually reinforcing processes. It will take time for it to take place, but that is the long-range essential ingredient. In the short run, of course, it needs also to be handled from the top down, that is to say, by the powers in power, by the officials in charge. And that, of course, perhaps introduces also some residual tensions into the process. Russia ultimately sees itself as co-equal in many respects with the major powers of the world and would like to have a distinctive status. The Poles see themselves as Europe, and would like to see Russia more as a part of Europe. <clears throat>
and particularly so because of the unpredictabilities of the overall Euro Eurasian context. The American posture on this is somewhat ambivalent as well. The United States wants to retain a special relationship with Europe. But the United States is also very conscious of the potential of major regional instability in Eurasia, and hence wants to have and should have a larger Europe, more engaged in trying to create a joint effort at some sort of, some sort of an equilibrium on the Eurasian continent. That brings up China and introduces the element of China into the American-Russian relationship, namely, in the American perspective, Russia is not in the same league as China. China today is a putative number one world power, a putative number one world power, certainly a competing rival. History will tell how that will turn out, but it is a partner with whom a solid, stable relationship is essential to stability on the Eurasian continent. For Russia, China is more ambivalent. For Russia, China can be a tactical asset in the relationship with the United States. But Russia is also, to some extent, a source of threat to its influence in Central Asia, perhaps even in some respects, history being so unpredictable in the course of the next four or five decades, perhaps even a threat to the territorial integrity of Russia and the Far East. So that is an additional external complication which creates a setting that affects the various calculations and predispositions of the two parties in this key process of reconciliation, the Russians and the Poles. That m feel, fills me again with a, a sense of responsibility that the people who are undertaking this process are assuming on their own shoulders. It reinforces my sense of genuine, true admiration for their dedication to this task. And it convinces me that their success is something in which we all have an enormous stake. So that's about all I want to say right now. Okay. We can right. have a discussion if you wish. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, he's happy to take a, a few questions. We'll go on for about maybe 10 minutes so we're not deprived of lunch and it doesn't get cold. So, so who, who is first? Who wants to, please, microphone, and if you could introduce yourself as well. Uh, Will Amatruda, uh, to what extent is Russian sovereignty over the Kaliningrad Oblast, which only happened in the wake of World War II, to what extent is that a complicating factor in Russian-Polish uh, reconciliation? Well, I think that's a question which probably should be more addressed to the Polish participants involved directly in the process. Insofar as my own opinion is concerned, I would say that it is only a problem when people like General Makarov speak up on this subject and start talking about preemptive military actions from uh, medium-range missiles deployed in the Kaliningrad area if the United States does this or that, particularly with the Poles. But I don't think otherwise it is a problem. The relationships between the Russians living in the oblast in the region and the Poles next door is absolutely neighborly. It's wide open. It's close. It's cooperative. I visited Kaliningrad some years ago, and I was already then struck how natural this neighborly relationship is, how close it is. It is, in fact, as we all know, the only directly contiguous Polish-Russian territorial connection, given the reality of Belarus and Ukraine. But if it is a measure of what is possible in the future, I would say it's a very hopeful measure. I think it's a good example of how far collaboration can go socially, economically, and in a quiet way politically. Actually, let me jump in with a question. Your sixth point on the difference between the French, German, and the Polish-Russian reconciliation process concerns this, this, this unease about a closer US-Russia relationship that Poland or some elements of the Polish elite may have had. Does that also um, uh, reflect in the neighboring, Poland's neighboring, uh, country's neighboring Poland regarding a Polish-Russian reconciliation. Yes, I think that's a good point. 
Uh, and that, of course, is something that I had partially in mind when I talked about the regional influence. Mm -hmm. uh, there were no regional obstacles or regional anxieties in Europe regarding Franco-German reconciliation. I think it's probably correct to suspect that in some of the countries that I mentioned, particularly in the Baltic republics, uh, a Polish-Russian love affair, which is not yet uh, surfacing, but which is, which is conceivable in some circumstances, would probably be of concern in some adjoining capitals. Right. Please, over here. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Brzezinski. Uh, if you could introduce yourself as well. Uh, Dan Gibbons, uh, Georgetown University. Uh, I would uh, wonder about the uh, uh, comments that you made with respect to the Chinese relationship and uh, the uh, almost uh, anointing of, of of Chinese as a as a as a global leader, uh, whether that's our um, role in, in the government to do this, and this is r in, in respect to what you said about um, uh, the uh, interest vis-a-vis uh, 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 -vis whether Russia was a regional or a or a global power. Uh, and this, how we how we determine how to approach Russia from the United States perspective. Specifically, uh, you take issue with, but you know the fact of the matter is China is now the number two world power, uh, viewed in a large sense, and with prospects perhaps of moving forward. But that's debatable. Yeah. That depends in part on what happens in China that depends in large measure on what happens in the United States. And I'm not one of those who's convinced that the United States is facing an inevitable decline. I do think we have some very serious domestic challenges. But by and large, the recuperative powers of the American society are quite remarkable. So I think it's premature to be making a final historical judgment. But that China is the number one, is the number two economy in the world is a fact. It is possible to become number one in the next 10 years. It has sufficient military power to deter any military threat towards it. It is becoming attractive to a large number of countries. It is a country which has some significance in Central Asia, which used to be part of the Soviet Union through the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which gives the Chinese an entry, which otherwise they might not even have had if it didn't exist. So in those respects, it is a player that looms significantly on the sort of larger dimensions of the American-Russian interaction. Okay, anybody else? Please, Obrad, over here. And then you. Maybe we'll take a couple. Um, so last questions, and this big will sort of round it off. Obrad Kesich, TSM Global Consultants. Uh, I'm wondering, could we add maybe one more potential uh, barrier or obstacle for improving Russian-Polish relations, and that is the Cold War mentality and the legacy of it and the persistence in terms of how we view uh, one another, how we view uh, political, strategic, geopolitical questions. And in particular, uh, it seems that the Poles have successfully uh, kind of absorbed most of the narrative from the Cold War from the perspective of being, number one, a victim, and number two, a part of the West. Um, so I'm wondering, is that an obstacle or is that something that doesn't play a role? Alexander Gaisuk, I'm a Russian journalist. Uh, I was wondering, uh, Mr. Vizhinsky, do you think uh, the U.S. could play any role in terms of uh, Russian-Polish reconciliation? And what kind of a role should U.S. be pursuing? Uh, and in this regard, do you think that the missile defense installations uh, that the U.S. and NATO uh, 
is going to uh, install in Europe could have any impact on, on this process. Thank you. Concerned, and particularly its applicability to the Poles, I would say it's not so much a Cold War mentality as perhaps hot war mentality. That is to say, a sense of awareness that what has happened in the course of the last century was devastating and that it's important to build structures and relationships that avoid it. I think that's at the heart of the present inclination to really emphasize German-Polish reconciliation. And I suspect it's in the background of their thinking when they talk of reconciliation with the Russians, something which is desirable historically, particularly in the light of the last century. It's a very painful experience. And I think to some extent that's true of the Russians too. Uh, the Russians, in some respects, see Poland either as an access to Europe or as a barrier to Europe, and especially if uh, hostility was to be the predominant mentality on one or both sides. As far as the U.S. role is concerned, well, the U.S. obviously has an interest and a constructive interest in Polish-Russian reconciliation, um, because Polish-Russian reconciliation, I think, can help fortify the American-Russian accommodation. Uh, I think the United States also recognizes that an accommodation with Russia by the United States or by the Poles also has implications for Ukraine, which consolidates its security and independence, but not in a setting of hostility with Russia, which is not in itself desirable nor as a defector from some sort of relationship with Russia that plunges into a West that identifies itself as intensely distinctive from Russia, but more as part of a larger accommodation that has geopolitical significance and I think would enhance the ability of the West to play the role of a key partner in a Eurasian equilibrium in which power is no longer centered in the West. For the last 600 years of global politics, and global politics have only existed for 600 years, it's been the West that has been the source of global power. And the struggles within the West ultimately became struggles over dominion over Europe and eventually the world. Today, in this differentiated situation, the Far East is a source of power. It's a new source of power in the world. But it can also be the source of new conflicts especially on the territorial margins of southwest Eurasia. And that could have unpredictably destructive consequences for everybody. So an arrangement in which Russia, Turkey, the existing Europe, America on the one side, and a Far East that can be balanced and in which its hostilities are neutralized and which can be enticed into a closer cooperation on global issues is the logical perspective for America to pursue. And in, the, in it, reconciliation with Russia, both of America on a higher geopolitical level and of Poland and Russia, particularly Poland as a middle range power on a lower level, is something that's very clearly compatible with what is the best rational definition of American interest. Okay, on that high note, thank you very much, Big, for joining us.